first of all, it's a pleasure to be on this panel uh, with my fellow scholars, and it's a pleasure to be here. My thanks to the organizers, and in particular, Yakub for the invitation, um, and to all of you for being here this afternoon. Um, we'll just go in order listed on the program, and so I will start. Uh, a caveat, rather than talking about the other side of the fence, uh, my presentation is actually about the fence itself, and I'm going to talk about the tribal areas, and in particular, the frontier crimes regulation, which uh, this is the first time I've presented this in Pakistan, so I'll be very interested for questions and feedback. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a historian of South Asia, and my previous scholarship has been on the 19th century, and so much of my uh, presentation is going to focus on the origins of the frontier crimes regulations. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that when this uh, regulation was first passed, and if I can have the first slide, please, um, in 1872, and thereafter, even as it's in force in Pakistan today, it was depicted as a kind of culturally conditioned response to Pathan particularism, the problem of the tribesmen of the frontier and their lack of civilization and outright savagery. Uh, the British like to think of this as uh, you know, a particular uh, solution to the particular problem of frontier governance. Uh, that's clearly been carried forward into post-colonial Pakistan, and as I'm sure all of you know, uh, though amended, the frontier crimes regulation remains in effect today. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the elements of the regulation, the issues of collective punishment, uh, the governance by traditional mechanisms, in particular the jirga, uh, a focus on blood feuds and preventative detention. Um, a couple of things that is missing from much of the current scholarship on the frontier crimes regulation, I think is its origins. Uh, it's mistakenly often referred to as having been passed in 1901. That was the third iteration of the regulation. It was originally passed in 1872, and it was based off the Hazara settlement rules of 1870. And the reason I draw your attention to that is the importance, not of culture, but of economics. Because really what was going on when the British put this in place was they were looking to understand the property ownership structures of the Hazara region. And when they couldn't figure it out, um, basically use this as a cultural bit of governance that, again, they like to characterize as something particular th to the Pathan. However, rather than this being a particular uh, solution to the particular problem on British India's northwest frontier, this becomes a globally resonant template that the British apply throughout their empire in the late 19th and early 20th century. If I can have the next slide, please. The frontier crimes regulation is not something particular or special to Pakistan, nor to Pakistan and the northwest frontier, but it is actually copied, first of all, on the northeast frontier of British India, uh, in the Kachin Hills and the Chin Hills. Thank you. Uh, excuse me. Um, in the Kachin Hills and the Chin Hills in the late 1890s, uh, and almost a direct carbon copy of what we see going on uh, on the Northwest frontier. But it travels outside the British Indian Empire. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, with actually the British Indian Army during the First World War, it travels to Iraq. Uh, the British Indian Expeditionary Force D uh, brings it with them in their occupation of the Basra Vilayat in 1914. And it's actually instituted by this man here, Sir Henry Dobbs, who was a political agent on the Baluch frontier and was uh, familiar with the frontier crimes regulation from his time there. It actually becomes a part of the uh, code for, um, first of all, mandatory Iraq and then independent Iraq only being abolished with the Ba'athist coup in 1958. From Iraq, it travels, if I can have the next slide, please, to Palestine to be used to govern the uh, Bedouin of the Negev Desert. Uh, and as you can see from this quotation here, the mandatory powers in Palestine believe it's coming solely from Iraq, but Iraq itself is a copy of the frontier crimes regulation from the northwest frontier of British India. Interestingly, while the mandatory authorities in Palestine note its provenance in Iraq, the colonial office in London actually says it's coming from elsewhere. If I can have the next slide, please. 
and that is Nigeria. Uh, because Nigeria we see, uh, actually it's, uh, it should be Nigeria, but we can do Kenya. <laughs> because what happens is Kenya's a, uh, the next place that's replicated in 1934. And Kenya's, uh, a really interesting example because what happens in Kenya is that they actually do a precise carbon copy. The uh, colonial administrators in Kenya are, as it were, so lazy that they simply they simply cross out British India and Patan and Baluch and they write in British Kenya and Somalis. Everything else of the uh, frontier crimes regulation remains the same except, of course, the name, which they changed the Special District's Administrative Ordinance. The next slide, please. Now, if the Frontier Crimes Regulation is the kind of constitution, as it were, of the uh, Northwest Frontier and is the legal code, then that is personified, I think, by no better colonial, or no other uh, colonial administrator better than Robert Sandeman who was the main colonial administrator on the Baluch frontier in the late 19th century. He's elevated in 1876, and after that comes up as head of the Baluchistan agency with his famous or infamous uh, um, Sandeman system. Now, if the frontier crimes regulation carries elements of law and norms by which the British want to govern uh, the Patans and Baluch of the frontier, then Sandeman uh, not only utilizes those elements, but he expands and adds to it, in particular the use of tribal militias to police the peoples of the frontier. And I think in combination, Sandeman's system and the frontier crimes regulation form a specific nexus of what I call frontier governmentality, a particular way that the British governed the frontier, not only of British India, but as we've seen, of Kenya, of uh, Northeast India, of Iraq, of Palestine, and even further abroad. And what are the elements of this frontier governmentality that are encapsulated both by the law and by Sandeman and Sandeman's system? Well, I think there's four. The first is this issue of indirect rule. After all, under the frontier crimes regulation and through the tribal agencies, uh, the inhabitants of what is today the Fata are largely left to their own devices, overseen by a political agent. Uh, the second is this idea of sovereign pluralism um, or suzerainty. And that is, especially when the British create this law in the 1870s, one of the things they are pained to underline is that this applies to the quote unquote independent tribes. So there is an explicit legal recognition of their independence. However, when pressed in Parliament, um, the Secretary of State for War actually has this, fun, this uh, fantastic quotation in which he says, well, the um, tribesmen on the frontier don't have real independence because they can't really transfer their allegiance any place. We just kind of treat them as independent. And I think it goes back to the layered character of political power and authority in the, in the colonial state that actually carries forward into the post-colonial state and we can still see in Pakistan amongst many other post-colonial states today. Um, the third that I have listed there is this idea of what I call imperial objecthood. If you look at the frontier crimes regulation, one of the most important elements of it is it denies those subject to it a venue to the courts. They have to be ruled through traditional institutions of justice, in this instance, a jirga. Now, the reason the British say publicly they want to do this is because they say the, the Pathan and Baluch tribesmen are not sophisticated enough to deal with the British court system, British Indian court system. In truth, it's that um, the British have experience of Pathan and Baluch tribesmen being very adept at navigating and jurisdiction shopping that system. And they want to exclude those people from that system. So they exclude them through the frontier crimes regulation. That puts them in a very interesting position because denied access to the Queen's justice, as it were, they are no longer colonial subjects, yet they are still apt to be acted upon by the forces of the British Empire. So they become imperial objects, people to be acted on without any uh, agency 
um, or venue to express that agency within the colonial system. And then finally, economic dependence. And here Sandeman is really the key because it's Sandeman's recruitment of tribesmen into tribal police forces to monitor their fellow tribesmen, which at the same time renders these tribesmen into wage laborers. They're monetized at the same time uh, they're monitored. And so they become dependent on the colonial economy, which then begins to tax them, but they're not paid enough to become active agents within that economy. So they're quickly rendered into a dependent position. Now hopefully the story I've uh, demonstrated so far is an imperial story that moves well beyond the confines of the northwest frontier of modern day Pakistan. But if I can have the next slide, it's an extra imperial story too. Because what we see is that the way the people of the hills, the tribesmen of the frontier, are ruled along the fringes of the British Empire is replicated in multiple other European or neo-European empires at this very same time. So, for example, in the mid-1870s on the San Carlos Apache Reservation, which is the second largest reservation for the, uh, in the United States, we see an almost identical system to the Sandeman system and the frontier crimes regulation produced by the man on the top, uh, a man named John Philip Klum. He creates tribal courts, he has a tribal militia, which he recruits tribesmen, tribesmen into. And yet, at the same time, the American government views the Apache as sovereign and independent, thus the special reservations. And um, to just emphasize that the particular problem of the Pathan, as the British would like to uh, conceptualize it, is one held by other states. I mean, even today in the United States, there are 313 Native American reservations that have this kind of semblance of independence, somewhat like the Fatah in uh, Pakistan today. But this is not simply an anglophonic story either. If I can have the last slide, please. We actually see a very similar thing happening at the exact same time, 1870s, 1880s, being constructed in Argentina. As Argentina expands into the Pampas, conquers the Indios, or the indigenous inhabitants of the Pampas, they construct a similar system of frontier governmentality. Now part of this has to do with an exchange of personnel. Um, if I can actually point him out. This man here is the man who starts this. His name is Julio Roca. He becomes the president of Argentina. He's not so interesting. It's this man back here, a man named Ignacio Fotheringham, who had previously served in the East India Company Navy and was drubbed out of the East India Company Navy, subsequently emigrates to Argentina and is central in the conquest of the desert. And he writes this terrible self-serving autobiography where he talks about how killing Indians on the Argentine Pampas is very similar to his experience of killing Afghans along the frontier of British India. Um, so if I can just have the last slide. What I hope to show is that the particular problem of the Pathan, as the British imperial administrators would have liked to conceive it, is really a globally ubiquitous problem for empires as they expand in the late 19th century of how to deal with these troublesome people of the hills. And in conclusion, as you all well know, with the persistence of the frontier crimes regulation today in Pakistan, this is not simply a historical artifact, but it's a living legacy that continues to shape the lives of people here in Pakistan and on the other side of the fence in Afghanistan today. Thank you very much. Dr. Razia Sultana, and I'm professor of history at Gaidiazm University, where currently I serve as a vice chancellor at Chaid Benazir Bhutto Women University at Peshawar. And uh, I'm going to just a little bit share my insights about uh, cross the border uh, situation in Afghanistan. Um, as I am a historian and uh, I'll just, so just uh, quickly uh, take you back to the genesis of the country which is now called Afghanistan and that is about 1747 when the first kingdom of Afghanistan had emerged and that was a result of a tribal consensus uh, decision by a uh, unanimous decision by, by the tribes in uh, 
Afghanistan and they decided that this area which was at the, now and at that time called uh, Afghanistan that was that remained part of a different empire as a, as a frontier of different uh, region of different empires like the Safavid, the, the Karakhanids, and the Mughals. So why not to have their own kingdom and to build their own uh, system of state? And that was the, the reason was that uh, that was the time when the Mughals and the Safavid and the Karakhanid, they were all in the state of decline. So uh, one of the leader which they, which they selected as their first king, that uh, Ahmad Shah Durrani, that was the one who served already under the, the Persians. So he had the military and he had the wherewithal and he had all that that uh, he was uh, bank, banked upon by the rest of the tribal elite and he was selected as the first king of Afghanistan. So that was the first point. And the other was, as I already mentioned, that the declining situation of the different empires that triggered the emergence of a new empire, later on that became an empire, but at that time of a kingdom for Afghans themselves. Um, these were the two very important variables. And the, how come this, this, uh, this kingdom turned into an empire that was again very important uh, to mention and uh, um, they had to um, they had to collect uh, or, or to consolidate the newly established kingdom, and for that they have they had to uh, collect the wherewithal, the revenues from different areas. And uh, east, that is India, was the most richest, and so the the, the first king of Afghanistan, Ahmad Shah Durrani, he he made ten campaigns, military campaigns against India, in order to collect the, the money from, from there and to consolidate the newly established kingdom of for the Afghans. Now, by the time 1772, when his, he passed away and uh, the kingdom was uh, inherited by his uh, son and successor, so it was already uh, turned into a, a huge empire and, and major part of Persia and, 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 and now Central Asia the mainland of Afghanistan and uh, up to Kashmir and uh, Delhi was also in, in 1756. Uh, Delhi was also conquered by Ahmad Shah Durrani himself. And so this all, these, these uh, the parts of the declining empires, they become parts of the newly established Afghan empire. And they remain in power till 1818. Later on, the, the empire disintegrated. Reason being that that what tribal elites decision what they had made when they when the situation when there started become disruption into it, and so the the empire started declining, and uh, simultaneously, uh, the the regional powers also started emerging, and the third variable which was a new one as well, and that was the introduction of the Europeans into that very region. Uh, before that was the time of traditional empires, and so the traditional empires had their regions and their internal dynamics, and they were grappling along with that. But when the Europeans are introduced, like the Russians and uh, the, the British, they were already in India, and so uh, that was the reason that their interest, that was something, uh, you must, some of you must have read about the great game later on uh, in Central Asia, and so, this, the tug of war that, that was there in, in, the, the, in terms of interest of these European powers in the region and because of that, you see that the, the, the borders were also demarcated uh, of uh, Afghanistan as well uh, by Russians and also by, by the British as well. That is the, the British, they draw the line um, between Afghanistan and the uh, British India in 1893 and the Russians there in 1895. So this was something the, the, the um, European element that was introduced into uh, Afghanistan and uh, so was the reason that you see the Amir uh, Dos Mamad Khan emerge. Now this is a local dimension. There are three tiers. One are the international, the regional and the, the, the local, the, the national dynamics of Afghanistan. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly referring to that time because I'm linking it to the current time as well. So uh, what it happened as a result, 
that uh, if you see that um, there were two things which are very important over the, um, over the centuries, the 19th century and 20th century and now 20th century in Afghanistan. One is intervention of the regional and international powers in Afghanistan and so the country could not, you see, stabilize politically and otherwise as well. And the other was the trade-off. Both the time, in both the, in the, even in the, this century as well, the, the local elites, they were trying to trade off between the two superpowers and so that they faced the blowback of it in the 19th century as well, in the 20th century as well. Why the Russians came into Afghanistan? Because Sardar Dawuz was trying to be smart enough to trade off between the United States of America and, and Russia, Soviet Russia in order to gain more and more uh, benefits for Afghanistan. And internal dynamics were that the local uh, political faction, they wanted rapid development and rapid progress in Afghanistan. They thought that the country is very backward, and some of them, a clique of them, they were foreign educated and when they came back and they looked at the country to be very backward. They thought we are in medieval time. In order to get the country out of the medieval age, the, there has to be rapid uh, progress and development in the country and for that you need money. Afghanistan was not rich, uh, that, that rich. It was a, one of a developing country at the remote uh, corner of the world. And so they wanted to rely on one superpower or another. So when they were looking at, they were, they were banking on earlier on, a, on United States of America. But when they, they, they just got it that United States of America is perhaps more interested in Pakistan or maybe India. So Soviet Russia, which had already had links with, with uh, Afghanistan, even the 1920s during the, uh, the time of Amir Amanullah Khan, they sign a, a, a treaty of uh, friendship between the two. So why not to bank upon them because they were ready to provide them all that what they exactly wanted. Uh, what Sardar Dawood, who became the, the president of Afghanistan after the 1973 bloodless coup, and what he did that he basically brought in the, Rus the Soviet Russians a lot into the country, even as a policy makers as well. But later on when he found out that uh, he could also equally uh, uh, grab the, the, the money from the Western powers as well, that was something that, that he had to pay the cost. And in the entire country and the entire people of uh, that country, they, they, they paid the cost. Now the 1979, the Russian intervention into Afghanistan and the, the bloody coup as a result of it, Sardar Dawood and the entire family, they lost lives. And that was not something, the, 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 the loss of a one uh, royal family, but that was something that br uh, brought about a watershed development in the entire history, political history of Afghanistan. You see the 80s era, the, the prolonged uh, 10 years long uh, civil war, then uh, when the Russians they withdrew in, in 18, 1989 as a result of the Geneva Accord, and you see the, the Soviet Russians, they withdrew and United States of America and other powers who are involved from the other side of the world into the same conflict, they also withdrew from the region. So what had happened? A new kind of a civil war, which was a factional war as well, because that was more internal. The war riddled country, it, it, uh, it gone through another phase of civil war, which was mostly internal. And as you know, that the regional power, they had their own stakes and they tried to be supporting one faction against the other, and the country never politically stabilized. Eventually, what it happened at a more radical uh, element like the Taliban, they emerged, who in the name of bringing about stability, political stability in the country, they, whatever havoc they play with, with the entire society, with, with the entire region. And finally, the United States of America, in the, in the, in the uh, wake of 9-11 incident, it directly intervened into Afghanistan. Now you see since 9-11 and the, the, the uh, December to um, October 2001 and till, till date, you see Afghanistan once again, it's, it remained into a turmoil, a complete turmoil, uh, though in the name of state building and nation building, a lot of project, a lot of money has been claimed to be invested into the development of the country, building of the society. But one thing, as a historian, I have to mention that Afghan people, they have never forgotten. They, no matter 250 years or 300 years or 400 years, maybe the future 
so many hundred years are passed, they are not going to allow a foreign power to directly involve into their affairs. No matter, they need them, as, there is, as, as I mentioned about the trade-off, that they would need them uh, to support them economically or militarily, but the Afghans, they want to do it on their own terms. Same is the case with the regional powers. There is a lot of discussion, usually they talk about that the regional power, Iran and, India, Iran and Pakistan and China, and India also, it's not a, a, a neighboring country, but Indian interest, as you know, is, is also there into the foreign affairs. Uh, there are, this, this is a topic that needs a separate discussion. But you see, the, the regional powers also want peace and stability to, to be consolidated. They want tranquility to, to restore, normal situation to be restored into Afghanistan. But somehow there's one problem, and that is that each of the country, each of the neighbor, even the international powers, they want stability, uh, political normalization of the situation on their own terms. So that is, the, that is the clash of interest between the local dynamics or the local elite, the, the political and military elite, and the, the, the regional and the international powers. Now, billions of dollars, they have been invested into state building and nation building into Afghanistan by the United States of America in the past 15 years or 16 years. With the drawdown in 20, December 2014, it was expected that finally the, the, the Western, uh, Western powers, the NATO forces, they would withdraw from Afghanistan. But the new setup when came into a, a United States of America, and you must have been reading as well, it is so, so, so new that the, the, the situation once again that has, seems like gone back to the square one because the, once again the military footprints is, seems to be enhanced, expanded, or, or likely to be expanded in the, in the, in the near future. And uh, it is again considered to be uh, uh, something that the United States of America take the responsibility to bring about that kind of uh, responsibility and to go after uh, the, the forces of ter terror themselves. Before this was, the, this was uh, after the Bush uh, two terms completion when President Obama took over and that was that the U.S. forces, the NATO forces, by December 2014 would completely withdraw from Afghanistan. And this is something that this is what the entire Afghan people, they want that, that the foreign intervention they would never tolerate. Uh, that is the reason of the survival of the Taliban as well. Otherwise, the common people, because they don't want war. Common people just like me and you, they want normal situation to, to prevail, to continue. They want their children to go to schools, they want to go to their jobs, they want to have a, a, a peaceful uh, environment where they would like to live, where they would like to uh, trust on their state or government system. They would plan their lives. This is, this is how me and you and normal Afghans are normal people. So they want it like that. But with, with, uh, why the Taliban, they don't want Taliban even. I'm talking about the people at large because they were the one who have been the cause of a civil war, the cause of killing and a lot of violence that have taken place and is taking place. But one thing that, that keep them survive uh, and somewhat a soft corner for them amongst the people and that is that they're fighting against the foreign forces. That is something that has to be borne on mind. This, is, this happened in the 20th century, this ha happened in the 19th century, because whenever the British in the 19th century tried to directly take over the reins of power in Afghanistan, and they had to face the music. They had to pay the toll. Um, same was the case with the Russians, when they were supporting Afghans through their military and economic uh, assistance, and so, um, they were fine, but when they tried to directly, they, they overthrew the uh, Hafizullah Amin government and they installed Babar Karmal in nine, December 1971 and you saw what it happened. The poor Afghans with empty hands and no training and later on, that's true that they were provided training and weapons by the free world. Uh, by the capitalist world, led by United States of America. That's true. But initially, they took the start that they themselves, that was a national rebellion against the foreign intervention. 
And, and same is the case in, in, in the 21st century that that uh, is happening and this, this civil war is not coming to an end. And one more yardstick that I like to bring into your notice and that is that uh, uh, the, uh, the, there, is, uh, there is another very important thing that the, uh, the jurisdiction of the, uh, the, the government of Afghanistan that is limited to Kabul and a few districts around it around more than 40% of the territory that is under these rebels control which, who are called as Taliban. So uh, these are a few lessons from history which could help uh, the policy makers and those who are involved into the making of Afghanistan. I guess without that they are not going to make it and uh, I hope so. All of us sitting here we wish well for Afghanistan and Afghan people. Thank you so much. Thank you very kindly. My name is uh, Dr. Ryan Brasher. Um, I teach political science at Foreman Christian College. It's good to see some of you Foremanites out here today. Um, thank you very kindly, Dr. Lazia, for your uh, um, very nice um, context setting, which makes my task a lot easier since I'm just talking about a tiny little window in Afghan history. Um, that also connects with Dr. Hopkins' um, uh, point about uh, sort of special zones that are governed indirectly and not in the same way as the, the rest of the country. So I want to talk to you about the patchwork state of Afghanistan. Now some of you may have uh, been aware of Ash President Ashraf Ghani um, uh, accepting the retirement of Ustad Atta, the governor of Balkh province, who has been the governor of that province since uh, 2000 and, well he's been the power there since 2003. When, when I was a, a young, naive uh, aid worker in that area, and he's been in power since then. And so Ashraf Ghani took advantage of a, of a situation to, to get rid of him. The, the move reminds me a lot about uh, the kinds of uh, things that Hamid Karzai did when he was the president. Um, he was able to remove Ismail Khan, who was the, the, the warlord or the, the power in Herat after a couple of years. Uh, similarly with uh, Abdul Rashid Dostum, he brought him to Kabul to get him away from sort of his Uzbek power base. Uh, interestingly enough, this is actually a very common pattern in Afghan. Uh, am I, hopefully I'm not butchering the mic. Uh, th this is a very common pattern in, in Afghan history. Um, there are certain areas where the state centralizes its power and seeks uh, complete control, but there's other areas where the state leaves considerable um, we can say autonomy, um, it rules indirectly, not directly. Uh, there's a political scientist, he's passed away since, his name is Guillermo O'Donnell, he's an expert on Latin America, but he called these brown spaces. Hence my, you can see I'm not an, uh, uh, an art student, so forgive my representation. Um, but those two provinces, southern province and eastern province, are supposed to be brown, just so you know. But anyway, uh, O'Donnell, uh, comes up with these three color schemes. The brown spaces are those spaces where the state is, has a very low presence, it's not really there. It's governed by local power brokers, by traditional elites, or by um, um, new criminal elites um, in Latin America. Green spaces are where the state is functional and strong. Um, that kind of looks yellow here. And blue spaces are kind of in between. Um, now this map that you see here is actually a map of Afghanistan. You, know, it, you won't recognize it today, but it's the provincial makeup of Afghanistan in the 1920s and 30s. It started changing a little bit afterwards. But essentially there was nine provinces. Uh, five big provinces, Wilayat, uh, and four small provinces, Hukumate Allah. And um, my contention is that there was a critical juncture in 1929 at which a particular person comes to power Mohammed Nadir Shah, who doesn't seek to govern, although formally Afghan, the Afghan government has always been very centralized. Um, governors are not elected, there is no local elections, everything happens in Kabul, which some people say is a big problem even nowadays. The, 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 the cake, the pie is, uh, is in Kabul. There is no um, prizes to be won in the provinces. Um, however, when he comes to power, he centralizes control of certain areas, particularly those areas that he views as enemies or traditionally not allied with him, and he, de he, he leaves autonomous those areas that he views as traditional allies. 
And there's some sort of ambiguous area. We can quibble about that. I've, I've written sort of more about that somewhere else, about the other parts of the country. But uh, what I'm essentially saying is that he centralized control in a very coercive, brutal kind of way in Kabul province, in, in um, Mazai in Turkestan, which then became Mazai Sharif, and in uh, Qadaghan Badakhshan. Uh, but he left the uh, southern province, which is today Zaloya Paktia, essentially, and the eastern province, which is around uh, Jalalabad, uh, fairly autonomous. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, next slide, please. So Nadia Khan is an interesting person. He was born in Dehradun. Um, in, in India fr from an exiled family. His family came back in 1901. Um, but he made a name for himself as a sort of a military a prodigy. And in, uh, the, uh, during the reign of Amir Habibullah from 1901 to 1919, he was involved, um, he essentially became the commander-in-chief of the Afghan army. Um, but he was particularly known for being able to quell tribal rebellions in the what today is Paktia, Paktika, and Khost uh, province. And he had particular traditional connection with the, 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 the tribal elite of the Mongol, the Zaze, and the, the Zadran. Now in 1913, a rebellion broke out, and he was sent there sort of as the fireman to quell the fire. And uh, he, he was able to uh, do this without too much coercion. And they persuaded the tribe. They killed a, a Ahmed Zai Rilzai, um, a, a rebellion, a rebellious leader, uh, who they viewed as an enemy. But they left these these other sort of uh, we can call them Kalanri tribes um, uh, alone. But they came to the agreement that these tribes have to send their sons to a special school in Kabul. So here you see one picture where Nadia Khan is sitting among these. Um, uh, uh, tribal Sai and sons of Mongol and Zazai and uh, Zadran uh, 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 tribes. Incidentally, um, Jalaluddin Haqqani, who is sort of uh, famous, uh, is also a, a Zadran as well. Um, here we can see him in 1929 uh, when he's about to be named king. In between, you've had the reign of Amanullah Khan, who's tried to, who's essentially tried to make Afghanistan into a modern country using Turkey using Atatürk's Turkey and um, Reza Khan's Iran as his, uh, as, as his model. Nadia Khan does not like Amanullah. He disagrees with him. Amanullah is trying to modernize the army. He's trying to get rid of the tribal organization of the army. Um, he's trying to get rid of the Pir Murid um, Sufi relations that exist within the army. And Nadia Khan says, no, we need to keep up these traditional relations. Uh, the thing comes to a, a head in 1925, uh, 24, when Nadia Khan is essentially exiled to France as ambassador, which is sort of a common tactic in Afghan history. When you have an opponent and you don't want to kill him, you send him off as an ambassador. Um, in 1929, when Amanullah is uh, overthrown, Nadia and his brothers, who are called the Musaiban brothers, they come back on a ship. And there's different views on that and how far it was a British conspiracy or not. Um, Certainly the British liked him better than Amanullah, but nevertheless, he is able to um, uh, organize, he has some difficulties at first, but he's able to organize a, a, a tribal Lashkar made up of Zazay, Zadran, and uh, Mongol tribesmen, along with some Ahmed Zai, Ghilzai, and most especially the, the Wazirs on the British side of the border. The British are not happy about that. In fact, they technically don't allow him to do it, but he does it anyway, and that's the only way he's able to uh, beat um, Habibullah Kalakani, who was the Tajik ruler, commonly called uh, Bachai Sakao, son of the water carrier, um, who many Pashtuns view as illegitimate. And so Nadia eventually is able to overthrow him, uh, pretends that he's not really interested in becoming king, and then pretends like the tribes are forcing him to become king. So in 1929, he becomes king. Now, how does he try to seek uh, to establish his central authority? Well, in the north, towards the north, he adopts a very brutal strategy. Whenever uprising resistance to the state comes up, uh, Habibullah Kalakani, the previous ruler, had his center in Afghan uh, Kohistan. It's a Tajik area, a Farsi speaking area. Um, Kodaman is another name for this. In 1930, July, there is an uprising there. And Nadia Khan um, tre uh, treats it in a very, very brutal manner. He essentially mobilizes these Loya Paktia tribes and tells them, I'll give you 100 rupees for every uh, Kohistani head that you bring back with you and you can take women with you, and we'll give you land as well in those areas. And so this, in essence, then becomes the way that they, they crush the, um, 
the opposition in, Taj in, in Kurdistan. Um, partially, he was forced to do this because these tribes were coming to Kabul, uh, but he didn't want them to stay in Kabul because if they'd stayed in Kabul, they would have looted the Kabul bazaars as well, so he had to shift them off somewhere else. Um, similarly, if we can go back one second, uh, in, in um, Afghan Turkestan, there is a fellow called Ibrahim Beg Lakai. He is uh, what we call a Basmachi, a, uh, um, a Turkic Uzbek, we can say, a resistance fighter to the Soviet uh, power that is spreading in Central Asia. And he's always sought refuge on the Afghan side of the border. So the, uh, the Soviets will hunt him, he crosses the border. The Amanullah sort of tolerated him. Uh, Habibullah Kalakani uh, supported him. But Nadir Khan wants to have good relationship with the, with the, with the Soviets, so he decides, uh, Ibrahim Beg, we're not going to host you anymore. So he takes, he has his brother, Shah Mahmoud, go up there and brutally crack down on, on Ibrahim Beg uh, um, and his support, Uzbek, especially Uzbek and Turkmen population that provide him support in northern Afghanistan. And uh, as a result, also, the Pashtun minority that had been living up there since Amir, Abdur, uh, Amir Abdur, uh, Abdurrahman's time in the late 19th century, uh, who had sort of um, become uh, disadvantaged after Kalakani's rise to power, now they sort of um, get back their privileged positions as landowners and these kinds of things in the north. And so we see a brutal suppression of the lo local population in these areas. If we can go to the next slide. Now, in the other areas of Afghanistan, Nadir Shah has a very different type of policy. Even though you have the same types of uprisings there, Nadir Shah does not crack down on them. In fact, he uh, tries to, uh, through diplomacy and sort of selective um, targeting of particular people, tries to get the tribes to agree that he is the rightful king and they shouldn't rise up and he'll just let them be as long as they let him be. And so in 1932, there is an uprising in uh, the southern province, in Loya Paktiga, especially among these uh, Darikhel um, uh, Zadran tribes. And Nadir Khan blames his political opponents, a long story, but uh, Ghulam uh, Nabi Charhi uh, for it. He kills off the, eventually kills off the entire family. But he doesn't punish the Darikhel Zadran. In fact, in, in 1933, in January uh, 3rd, I believe, in, in the official government mouthpiece, it's a law. Um, he writes, he starts with a sentence saying, I farzandone um, bad bakhto jaheleman. So, oh, he's talking to them as if they are his children. So not like they're his enemies, but they're his children, like they need to be punished and need to be brought back into the fold. Uh, so he's a very different approach to them than he does uh, to, to, to Turkestan and to, to Kurdistan. We can see that um, by 1964, the provincial makeup of Afghanistan has changed considerably. However, southern province still is the same. Same boundaries. Um, the, bo the, the, the boundaries stay intact. In a sense, that's a symbol of the fact that this area still has tribal autonomy. It is Afghanistan's Fatah, if we could say, in a less formal way than Fatah is itself. Last slide. I just want to show you this. Um, uh, my goal is for you to memorize all these names in five minutes. Um, these are minor civil divisions um, of the southern province. Um, and we can see that in other areas of Afghanistan, uh, Nadia Shah uh, and, um, maintains and enhances Amanullah's previous bureauc bureaucratic system where there's a true hierarchy and uh, it sort of represents the capturing of the, of the periphery by the center. But in the southern province, you see that most of these names of these minor civil districts and, and um, counties are actually not so much geographic markers as they are tribal names. A majority of these are tribal names, which tells us that this is actually not a minor civil, this is not a county or district in the conventional way. It's simply giving uh, legitimacy to the fact that these tribes are self-governing, self more or less. Now, I um, looked at the tribal division, uh, sorry, the minor civil divisions that exist today in that region, and uh, a good many of them haven't changed in um, 80, 90 years. So we can see that this, of course, 1978, 1979 was a big watershed in Afghan history. But still, this official um, recognition of the autonomy of tribal, um, of, of tribes still exists in, in Afghanistan to this day. Thank you.
So uh, my question, hello. I'm, I have the mic. I raised my hand first. <laughs> anyway. Um, so my question is to Madam Razia. Uh, Ma'am, when uh, uh, the USSR um, sent its forces to, uh, to Afghanistan, uh, what, wha what, wha what was their purpose? Uh, did they want to, as when we say that we uh, actively participated in the war to uh, uh, not to allow uh, 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 or the USSR to take over Afghanistan, it was because we felt or, or uh, they said the reality was that they wanted to gain access to warm waters through Pakistan. So by helping the Afghans, we were basically helping ourselves. Is that a myth? What was the agenda of the USSR? Was it to actively be there or uh, just to ha install a puppet regime, regime and return? How come uh, uh, Soviet Russia was involved more as compared to United States of America in Afghanistan? It is all the trade-off that who is giving more aid because Afghanistan was a small, regional, remote, developing country. It needed economic and military assistance. It tried a lot on the United States of America, but when no warm response they received from there, and then they looked up to Soviet Russia in the 50s, they got a lot of uh, uh, support in terms of economic and military, and a number of uh, students, they went for graduation and training from the military to the Soviet institution, Moscow, and the Central Asian uh, republics as well, they were part of the Soviet Russia at that time. Now by even Sardar Daoud, he tried to switch over to United States of America and the Western Bloc and trying to be smart enough to get the economic and military support from there too. That was the thing which annoyed the, uh, the you see the leaders in Soviet Russia and uh, first of all, he was overthrown, and and then later on, the the, uh, the the Afghan Communist Party who came into power first there was uh, uh, Nur Muhammad Tarakai, and he was you see deposed and he was killed. That was an internal uh, development. But uh, when uh, Hafizul Amin, when he became finally the prime minister and the president of, uh, of the then Afghanistan, and he was also suspected by the Soviet uh, leadership that he was more inclined towards the United States of America, so he was also removed. And uh, and in the, that, that was that was something that uh, you read between the lines. But apparently they they did not come for that purpose. They basically came. They said that uh, a friendly regime that has been established in Afghanistan, and Babarak Karmal was appointed as the pre president of Afghanistan, um, and uh, they had a, a friendship treaty signed between the two countries in 1978, and under that, in, sur in such circumstances, Soviet Union could send their forces in order to support back and a, a regime, a friendly regime in Afghanistan. So with the, with the bloody uh, a coup uh, in, in 1979, uh, when um, Hafizullah Amin was removed, so the, such situation emerged wherein the Soviets, they, they, uh, they were supposed to send their uh, support to a friendly country and a friendly regime. That was so no something. You see, uh, what consequences or implication it had for the region and for the international world, that's a different dimension. You asked first about that how come th this, uh, the Russian, they came for the rescue or for the support of uh, the, Af the then Afghan government. Now, as you know that Pakistan and Afghanistan, they share the border. So the border countries, they certainly, and then there is a huge uh, number of Pakhtuns, maybe at that time more Pakhtuns living in Pakistan than in Afghanistan, or maybe equal uh, number of Pakhtuns living in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And so we had the border dispute, and we had the Pakhtunistan dispute, and 
So that kind of issues, dentist claims, and they were going on between right from the inception of Pakistan, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. So uh, the consequences for it for Pakistan, uh, reaching out to the warm waters, and you see, they, these were the apprehensions um, which have been uh, debated a lot into the scholarly literature on the Soviet intervention into Afghanistan. Hope I answered your question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my question is to Sir Hafkan. Sir, you talked about uh, frontier crime regulation and uh, the frontier governance and in the context of uh, the constitutional institutions. Uh, the Pakistan National Assembly uh, yesterday passed uh, a law regarding uh, the frontier uh, 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 FATA province, FATA uh, area, uh, in which uh, the uh, area, the jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction of uh, the Peshawar High Court and Supreme Court was extended uh, to FATA. Uh, what will be the impact uh, of this legislation on the people of FATA? I would say the issue that faces Pakistan and the FATA, like the United States on its reservations, is that um, these areas have historically been fiscal sinks. These are not areas that you make money in terms of taxation. Uh, so the political economy is such that, why did the British put the FCR in place in the first place? Because they did a simple cost-benefit analysis. It would be too costly to extend regular administration there. Um, I think that though circumstances have changed, what has prevented the FCR from being abrogated in 1947 or in 2001? It's the same uh, question of political economy that faces the Pakistani state. I mean, there is the possibility, as we've seen, for instance, in the army going into North Waziristan, of having to, to fight its way in against irredentist claims of some sort or another. Um, but there's also social structures that have been solidified by a century of the frontier crimes regulation that are going to be challenged and possibly peacefully, but possibly violently deconstructed with the extension of regular administration into that space. And I think it's going to be a challenge for the Pakistani state, uh, whatever course it pursues. Um, I mean, you know, I think that anybody under the FCR has a bad deal and that uh, it can only improve from there. Yeah, we were actually expecting, um, like, not a politically correct answer. Rather, maybe what you think that will happen, or you think these developments will actually change the scenario or the people will continue uh, being oppressed uh, by the political agents, by the tribesmen, by the heads of Jirgas, because hundreds and hundreds of years of uh, legacies uh, have been in place. And uh, uh, you also see that a, a few months back, the people have been coming up with peaceful protests against the FCR, the locals, the father residents. And it's perhaps because of those developments and also uh, because they were spearheaded by uh, some influential activists uh, in Pakistan, and that perhaps made the government reach the point that it did yesterday. Do you think these developments will actually help the people get liberated, or you think that the challenges or the legacy is just too dark and too big to be overcome? Well, I think it's time. time's up, and to give you a straight, unpolitically correct answer, I think you've largely answered it yourself, significant Okay, sir, this is going to the last question. So, why is the Afghan government so resistant on accepting the Durand line demarcation? What is the reason? Uh, the Afghan government, it's it's very resistant on accepting the Durand line demarcation. Whenever the Pakistani government tries to build a fence or anything, anything that symbolizes that this area is ours, uh, clashes emerge. Uh, what 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 could be the reason specific? Maybe Dr. Razia would be better on this, but um, I think the Afghans just don't accept, uh, they essentially view the Durand line as something that was imposed on them by the British in 1893, and that they never really had a voice in, in uh, sort of um, making firm. Now, I, f 
50% of the Afghan population doesn't care because they're not Pashtun. But I think uh, there is some Pashtun nationalists who still very feel very strongly about this. I have a map in my office from uh, Afghanistan in the 1960s, and the Pakistani side doesn't say Pakistan, it says Pashtunistan. And so this tells you, this was the ideology, particularly during, uh, you were talking about Sardar uh, Dawood Khan. He, uh, he was really pushing this, and that's why he had very bad relationship with Pakistan. As you know, Afghanistan was the only country that did not uh, vote for the creation of Pakistan in what the future hold for Afghanistan. So my answer is I'm too, maybe too optimistic because I think that Afghans, they've gone through so much. War and war and rebellion and intervention and all of this music they have been facing over the ages. And it's so much now that this, the good thing now has to come and the, the future must be holding good for them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 